This is Fictitious, a podcast about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. I'm Adrian Buskey. I'm joined in this episode by author Nicholas Eames. His debut novel, Kings of the Wild, was published in 2017 from Orbit. It's an epic fantasy with a rock and roll twist, which follows a group of aging mercenaries putting the band back together to help rescue their frontman's daughter. His latest book, Bloody Rose, came out in August 2018 and continues the band series as a sequel to Kings of the Wild. Nick, welcome to Fictitious. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you on. I just finished Kings of the Wild. I haven't had a chance to read Bloody Rose yet, but I'm very excited about it. And I have to say, calling back to an interview that I did with Robert Jackson Bennett recently, I told him like when I read Foundry Side, his latest novel, that I was like, oh, I felt like as a as a computer programmer, this is a book that was like written for me, right? Like, but I had not yet read Kings of the Wild and realized that, oh no, 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 I was totally wrong. This is the novel that was written for me. <laughs> because full disclosure, I'm a 41 year old rock and roll guy who probably can't see and the listeners can't see that behind. I mean, there's a stack of amps to one side of me. There's a closet full of guitars back this behind there. I can see him and he ain't lying. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been a band guy since I was in high school. So this conceit of Kings of the Wild, this, this fantasy world where mercenary bands are sort of the rock stars of the world is really, really fun. And the story is seeded with a lot of kind of meta references to the world of music. And so I really, really enjoyed that about it. In your own words, like what is the band series about starting with Kings of the Wild? Like what, you know, what is that re- that story all about? It began, it's kind of changed, I think. It began as obviously just that basic conceit. It was almost like a joke. Like what if mercenary bands were the equivalent of rock bands? Uh, and it's kind of something that you might say to a buddy well stoned or drunk, and then you'd both laugh about it and then never think about it again. But yeah, instead, I wrote it and committed my <laughs> a year of my life to it, <laughs> listened to a lot of 70s rock. And, it, and yeah, it began as kind of just using that as, a, as almost a shtick. But when I start, started writing it, it ends up working pretty well for a fantasy world. And I think you see that more in the second book. But you know, if, if groups of four or five guys or women wanted to go around killing monsters, you know, why wouldn't they get kind of famous doing it and why wouldn't people absolutely adore them and know them wherever they went and wouldn't they perhaps then get someone to manage their where they stayed for a night and who they fought and things like that and then a natural progression of that is why would we go find the monsters why wouldn't we bring them into arenas and fight them for ourselves and get super famous and make all this money so uh it it works i think as a as the whole basis for a for a world and a setting and so that's kind of what it began as with the general idea of let's go rescue this guy's daughter and get the band back together Whereas, and the second book, too, has a, a very simple kind of band story. It's almost like an almost famous type, like a rock journalist is on the road with a band that she admires. But the books ended up kind of being way more about family. And in the first one, it's a lot about fatherhood, friendship, too, the bonds that kind of last even after all these years. And the second one is very much about motherhood, kind of like a, the found family sense of like your home, not necessarily being where you're from, but being where you are and the people that you're with at the time. Uh, and that's become kind of a theme of, of the entire books. So, Nick, I have to ask, are you a band guy? Have you have you been in a band? I've never been in a band. I can't play an instrument, I don't think. I could probably play pretty mean cymbals <laughs> if given proper direction. But yeah, I know that uh, that kind of music, like especially Kings of the Wild, the 70s rock, was something that I had kind of an appreciation for, but not a deep appreciation for. It was one of those things that before I got involved in it, I knew I should like it, like drinking scotch or having black coffee. It was like, I need to get there someday. Uh, so when I finally started listening to it, it, it just blew me away, like honestly, and it took hold of the whole book and was an amazing inspiration because you always hear people say things like, oh, you know, rock used to be better, rock used to be better back in our day. And they're just so friggin' right. It's ludicrous. <laughs> and even like, you know, then I, for the second book, I moved into from the 70s rock to the 80s. And I, that was more familiar to me because it was my childhood. And, and, uh, and then now I'm into the 90s with book three. And it's like all so, so familiar and it's still pretty good, but any greatness that it has, to me at least, is just echoes of the real glory that was in the 70s. Uh, because in the 70s, you got that, those rambling, just epic rock songs that lasted 10 minutes, didn't care if they fit on a radio station. You know, they just were there for the music and the sound and the feeling of it. And the storytelling. Exactly. As opposed to kind of the ego of it, which they took over in the 80s. 
and then the angst of it, which took over in the 90s. <laughs> and whatever we're at at the, uh, this point in time with things. <laughs> I don't know what we're at, yeah. I got to say, uh, having been a band guy, having played in a lot of bands over the years, but having a core group that I played with in college and uh, and a group of guys that like 12 years later, we had that conversation like, hey, let's put the band back together. Not to go on any big epic quests, but just to dust off the guitars and make some noise. You really nail the feel of being in that kind of group. In Kings of the Wild, I was really struck by how well you understood those relationship dynamics. And I mean, being in a, in a band for a long term is a lot like being in a marriage. And the, the relationships that you have with the people that you play in a group and spend that time with and go, you know, driving around with and having those adventures with is deep and complicated and both like loud and brash, but also pretty subtle and all the complexities of it. And, uh, and I felt like what you did with that group with Kings of the Wild with Clay and Gabe and, and company, um, really hit at the core of that in a big way. So I felt the truth of it. Even if you haven't done it before, you understand that dynamic very well. I appreciate you saying so. It's definitely something that uh, that I was going for, and I read I read a few books on it, and I watched a hell of a lot of documentaries on rock bands and things like that while I was while I was uh, writing it. Sometimes I also get uh, military too. People that were in the military ask if I've been in the military before because it has same similar kind of bond where you know even after you go your separate ways, you've all endured something together that that binds you forever. Yeah, it's like this shared history thing where like nobody else has that particular little piece of time that those people do and that deep connection. I think and I think purpose has a big part of it too. When you have shared purpose, uh, yeah. um, you know, that that always leaves an indelible mark on you, you know, and it sticks around a long time later. But it's very it's amusing to be at the point in time I am in my life. I mean, I just started going back to the gym again like Monday. So I'm feeling yeah. the the creakiness <laughs> in my joints. Yeah, and we did squats and and uh, I'm suffering for it. So reading Clay Cooper talk about his bodily challenges while still trying to go out and fight rang very true as well. Yeah, me too. That I can attest to. I've got the sore back and I pee more than I want to and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's an interesting look at the fantasy genre to, you know, we're used to brash stories of barbarians and adventurers and charismatic people with rapier wit or whatever, but to come back around to some people that have been out of the game for 19 years and yeah. kind of have to pick it back up and figure out if they're actually still good at it again. Yeah, exactly. And, then, and again, as a parallel, and not to harp too much on my own stuff, but when my band got back together after 12 years, most of which none of us had been playing music, we got together at a friend's house, plugged in all the instruments, went right into one of the first songs, and sounded as good as we did 12 years earlier. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And so looking at the guys in Saga, the band in, in Kings of the Wild, they dust off the rust, but very quickly, even though they're older, they're, they still kick yeah. a lot of ass, and they're still a formidable group together. It felt very real because again I had been right in that moment I'm like yeah that's kind of what it's like it's like once the dynamic reclicks it's all still there oh that's great to hear what was the genesis of Kings of the Wild I mean you said that like uh you know you came up with this you know this kind of conceit over kind of a joke but I mean did it start off as more of a humor novel were you trying to to write more of a comedy that turned into a kind of a serious fantasy or how did that happen uh, it's a, that's an awesome question. Uh, yeah, it was that. It was, um, I mean, it began with the conceit. I think I had, I had recently read Ready Player One, which, you know, obviously is kind of like a, an homage to all the things that that author loved. And, uh, and then that book got me listening to Rush because there's a scene in it where he has to play a Rush song to open a, a certain challenge. And so I got listening to Rush and I think I got a feeling Rush might have been the genesis of all of this because 70s Rush especially was so fantasy, so all about these epic stories. And I think that's what kind of, spark the idea. But at the time, I'd been writing another book for about 12 to 15 years that was really serious, you know, inspired by when I was younger, when I read books like Robert Jordan and Game of Thrones, and it was multi-POV. It had, you know, all the war and culture and religion. It was super serious and no, like no humor in it whatsoever. It wasn't really my voice. It was me kind of trying to emulate the voices of all the authors I loved. And I thought it was the one and I worked on it for 15 years and I rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it and split it up at one point and into two books and rewrote the first one. Uh, and so with, when I came up with the idea for Kings of the Wild, it was just called The Band at the time, I wrote the first three chapters and I wrote them really quickly. just kind of like came out like Clay Cooper's character was just bam there. And then I actually put it away for a year, despite thinking it was an awesome idea and I hope someone doesn't do it before me. Uh, I put it away for another year, worked on this other book again for a year. And then while I was sending it out to get rejected, it was like, okay, I might as well write this one to keep myself busy. 
it's almost like I didn't care as much off the beginning. I didn't try to make it serious. All through the years I was writing that other book, I would never have read a book with like goblins in it, you know, or orcs like they are. <laughs> I considered myself too erudite for them. I was past that. That was my teenager <laughs> stuff, you know, and, and books at the time didn't have that kind of like, all the books I was reading that I love, Joe Abercrombie, you know, Scott Lynch didn't have that kind of stuff. They were almost like fantasy without being fantasy. And that's how they lured non-fantasy readers in. And I think that's kind of how a lot of them got so big is when you can recommend a book to a non-fantasy reader, then that helps kind of broaden its, its uh, possible readership. But at the time, I was just I was sick of writing that thing for so long, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to write just what I love and and try to make it make sense and try to make it appeal to someone who is a non fantasy reader. So I just winged it, and if by God, if I wanted to put a goblin in there, I put a goblin in there, and uh, and yeah, tr- try to write it in my voice. And it began super super funny, you know, with all the ridiculous stuff that's in it. There's a, you know a scene where everyone fights that they have boners and things like that. <laughs> um, but I think just as someone who my favorite author in the world is Guy Gabriel Kay, who's a really sentimental author. And then just in general, I'm pretty I'm pretty softy myself. So those more poignant scenes kind of snuck in there, and I couldn't write it without adding that to it as well. And then ultimately, in the end, when I look back on it, like just humor is such a huge part of a lot of people's lives. Maybe not everybody, but definitely mine. You know, I haven't, I've been to a few wakes in my life, and I've made a lot of jokes at those wakes. Like everyone I know has. You just you use humor to deal with, serious situations all the time right so i think i think it works pretty well and i think people can relate to it and then on another small tangent is that when you write a book that you say you want you want to be able to recommend to non-fantasy readers it's one thing to be able to create your own version of like an orc and call it something different or a whole different monster and if people like are down for fantasy they'll want to learn about that monster and learn about your world but if you're writing a book that you want to have an appeal to just anyone like my mom for instance if even if she wasn't my mom you just use the word orc because mom kind of knows what it is or use the word goblin she kind of knows what it is she may not like it but she'll gloss over it and keep reading the story as long as the story keeps going then she'll keep reading whereas if you introduce some some, something weird then she just especially right off the bat they just kind of pull away people tend to pull away so i want to write a book that you could recommend to anyone but that would bring up a lot of nostalgia for a longtime fantasy reader yeah, I felt like in getting into the Kings of the Wild that initially I had this sense of being like, this is kind of what I think of as sort of like a D&D world. It's a high fantasy world with low fantasy characters, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think totally. like when you talk about like Joe Abercrombie, I think like he's in that grim, dark, low fantasy kind of space where the characters are gritty and they're ambiguous alignments of, of character and whatnot. But but yeah, I mean, this world, I think initially it was like it was pretty easy to jump in because like as a fantasy reader, I'm like, OK, I get this. Like you said, there's goblins and, and trolls yeah. and whatnot. And so I get it. But the more the story goes along, the more you elaborate, the more you bring in new elements. I mean, there were some some fantasy creatures that I encountered in there that I wasn't familiar with that I don't know if were whole, made of whole cloth by you or if they were just an aspect of fantasy I hadn't encountered before, but had definitely had me intrigued. Yeah, some of them remain up, but most of them are the old standbys. Yeah, but it, but it works because the voice is fresh. You know, and this is a conversation I have with people all the time. Uh, we talk about creating fresh stories in fantasy. Like, where do you where do you go in a genre that's been very well trod at this point? Um, you know, if fantasy gives a framework to play with that there is a familiarity with and people can jump into um, and not necessarily have to get beat over the head with 100 pages of exposition to understand the world. Yeah, you can get in and tell a story and then develop the world around it and it will flesh out for people as it goes along. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and don't get me wrong, like I love a good complex fantasy story. Love them, love them, love them. But I'm never going to read one and go, oh my God, that was so good. That, com- that was like everything I wanted in a book. Hey, mom, you should read this. Or hey, friend, you should read this. Because I can only recommend them to fantasy readers. Like I love our Scott Backer. I don't know if you've ever read his stuff, The Darkness That Comes Before. I'm not familiar, no. It's just unbelievably complex, so beautiful, so much about like war and culture and religion. It's pretty much the book I was trying to write, but better. But I just, I can't recommend it to anyone that doesn't really, isn't in for the long haul, you know? So is there something to be said for simplicity sometimes? Yeah, well, it's so much fantasy is doorstopper. You know, like yeah. you've got these enormous books and you're like, oh, it's this is a thousand pages and it's the first in a 13 book series. And yeah. hardcore fantasy readers rejoice because they live for that. We love it. We love it. Casual readers are like, get that the hell away from me because they, you know, exactly. they just can't even imagine devoting that much time to something. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's a real challenge to kind of figuring out like, you know, who will be into it. Um, you know, you we were talking about like there is some absurdist comedy in this, and I think in a very natural way because our own lives are pretty absurd at times. And yeah. so these guys 
despite being a rather serious bunch, discounting Matrick and Moog because they are certainly not serious <laughs> yeah. characters, but um, yeah. but they're in very serious situations, but yet they find that humor and absurdity in it. When you're writing something like that, especially as the book developed into something that had a greater sentimental, you know, emotional quotient to it and becomes increasingly more epic as, as the, the story goes along, did you find a way to, to specifically balance humor versus seriousness versus sentimentality? Did you, like, is that something that you strove to be like, okay, I really need a 33, 33, 33% mix and 1% something different <laughs> to do it? Or was it just a natural evolution and then you let, it, let the editor tell you if you'd gone too far astray? Exactly that last one. I mean, I def I try to keep it balanced, but when it comes to that, you got to rely on a little bit of your, your own beta readers, even though they're probably a little bit biased to yourself. But your editors are the key there because the editors are the one that, you know, not only can they look at the book objectively, but they know the genre, you know, as well, maybe not better than you, but is as good as you. And they, they're look, looking to see what makes a balanced book. Uh, and so my editors and my agent too, were, were pretty instrumental in helping me tone down some things and, and add some things that kind of ba help balance it all out. Examples would be, I mean, God, right off the bat, when I first had my first call with my agent and at the time, of course, I wanted to impress her. I would do whatever she said really to, to get her to take me on. She's like, oh, I love the book. I love the book. The boner scene has to go. <laughs> and, and I'm like, gone. It is gone. Whatever you say. I realize it's absolutely absurd. Fine. It's gone if that's what you want. And then I was talking to some friends, some people that had read the book, and they were just like, no, no, you got to fight for it. You got to fight for it. That's what makes your book unique. And so I went back to her and I was like, listen. I know I said I'd get rid of the boner scene, but what if I just changed it? I told her that, you know, five out of five people agreed. Five out of five dentists agreed it should stay in there. <laughs> so I just removed certain words like gesticulating. And I think maybe I moved the word erection or took that right out of it and just made it a bit more subtle. And and that ended up working for her. And then my editor, obviously, she she really liked it too. And and yeah, a lot of the I had to fight a little bit for a lot of Moog stuff scenes where they say they're where they're walking five abreast up the hill and he trips over his robe and trips all of them. That might have been excised where I didn't had I not fight for it a little bit. Um, the part where he's pulling hams and stuff out of his hat and throwing them at people, like <laughs> I think it was worth fighting for, and I think it turned out really well, and it adds a bit of kind of levity to the book. The joy of having you know, these sort of like team books is that as a reader, I, at least for me, uh, I feel like I can't help but start trying to identify those people with some of the people in my own life. You know, like I said, I had a band, so I had that in like in, my bass player is Clay Cooper. Like, oh, really? He's not of that stature or whatever, but he is of that yeah. particular kind yeah. of personality and resolve. So the whole time oh. I just felt like, oh, I'm, I'm reading Gene. Like he's, this is him on, on paper. So this is pretty cool. What did you play in your band? Uh, I was the lead guitar player in the band. Yeah. And then I've been a, like a solo singer songwriter guy for a long time. So yeah. it, in, in looking at the dynamic, despite not being the front man of that band, I am much more the Gabe of the group. Whereas yeah. our lead singer was much more the metric right down to being <laughs> kind of a mess of a drunk. But, but yeah, but it's like there, we have a friend who, who plays in my D and D group who is almost a hundred percent Moog. And so some of these just absolutely absurd things that he would do and these weird tangents he would have, it's straight up my friend, Matt, where I'm like, Oh yeah, he's, he's the one who comes up with the craziest ideas and will tangent in a way that you can't expect, but he's absurdly funny at the same time. Yeah. And so I'm so glad that you didn't lose those sequences with Moog because a lot of epic fantasy has a slog to it, right? Like there's the – what I always call the long dark, which is like the the thing that happens to a lot of fantasy novels where there's a long stretch where everything sucks and it, it's a real grind and it's a grind for the yeah. reader as well as the characters. Yeah, I agree. And having these characters like Moog, like Matrick, and the kind of sardonic way that Clay Cooper looks at the world really helps to ease the elements during those times of trouble. So um, yeah, I was very appreciative of that. Yeah, I think so too. I think TV shows too can fall into the same thing, same as books. Like when things are just going bad for too long, it's not fun for anybody. Right, which is why I can't watch The Walking Dead because it's all bad um, all the <laughs> yeah, time. <exactly. laughs> yeah, you said that you you worked on one novel for like 15 years before like throwing into mm -hmm. this. What was the, the world building and outlining process for Kings of the Wild then? Or were you outlining? Were you pantsing? Like, you know, what was the writing technique? Uh, with Kings of the Wild, it was 100% pantsing. 
I knew where it was going to end. I mean, it, they say where it's going to end right off the bat. They, they have to get from point A to point B. And one thing that kind of can be a pet peeve of mine in fantasy books, uh, which is funny because it's in so many books and it's the whole basis of Kings of the Wild, is this long, like you said, a slog through a forest or like through wilderness when you just know what the next chapter is going to have in it. I mean, obviously Lord of the Rings did that, but I've read a lot of books where I just kind of either put them down or just try to barrel through where people are just traveling for a long period of time. Uh, and so when a reader knows where the book's going to end up, you have to kind of try to add as spice it up as much as you can along the way. So when writing King of the Wild, I had no outline. I knew they had to get the band back together and then I knew they had to go west for, you know, a thousand miles. Um, and so I just kind of, I think pantsing that book helped because I would get to the end of a chapter and think, okay, what would be the most absurd thing to happen next chapter? Where do I think it's going to go? I'm going to take it the opposite way. And adding things like airships in there, which definitely, definitely, definitely some say, and they're right, are a deus ex machina. Like, you know, you can use them for however you want. And I did use them for however I want because you can use them to suddenly be like, oh, this changes the dynamic. Oh, I thought these people were going to be walking here. Suddenly they're flying. And then, bam, suddenly they're not flying. So suddenly my my what I think is going to happen has changed again. So yeah, I tried to spice up up all the time and have the journey from A to B zigzag, you know, through the entire alphabet on the way. It's a very colorful novel in the sense that, like, I almost felt like, you know, if there was like the visuals from like, say, like the Guardians of the Galaxy, where you have like that kind of intensity of color and strangeness and wonder mm -hmm. in a world, Kings of the Wild had that, where in my head, it was always vibrant and alive. And then right down to the big climactic stuff at the end of it, which is maybe as epic as any finale I've ever read. Um, <laughs> but like, to book two. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, okay. So, you know, speaking of book two with Bloody Rose, one title's kind of a spoiler. Uh, if, uh, <laughs> if you, if you read uh, uh, Kings of the Wild, so you kind of have an idea of where some of that's going, but after you've, you've successfully put together Kings of the Wild, you have an agent, you've got it published, it's out there in the world, and now you're going to write a sequel. And, yeah. uh, and from every author I've ever talked about, writing a sequel is very different from writing the first novel in a series. So for Bloody Rose, how did that change what you were doing, or did it change how you were doing it? Uh, it definitely was far more difficult than writing the first one because the first one I could do it on my own time. I did it actually pretty quick just because I was, was in the practice of writing a lot and I wanted – the story was so exciting that I wanted to tell it kind of thing. I needed to get it out and I thought if I don't do this soon, someone's going to steal this idea. Right. So with the second one, a deadline, perhaps not for everybody, but for me adds an insane amount of pressure. And also by the time I was like partway through writing the second book, the reviews started to come in for the first book. And not that like there wasn't like bad ones affected, but almost oh, the kind of the good ones affected me more than the bad because the good ones I when you're in the middle of a book that's unfinished and unpolished and, you know, every writer, at least according to Twitter, goes to this segment where they think that their book is shit. So when you're in that and suddenly your first book comes out and people are really liking it, you're like, oh, my God, I'm not going to be able to repeat this process. Uh, yeah, it was a bit more difficult. And then just a lot of things you kind of maybe because the deadline, I think, for me, for my style of writing, I tend to – I'm trying to go so fast and panic, right, that I end up going down dead ends that I don't realize are dead ends and plow through because i got to hit this deadline and then eventually realize that it's just not going to work. And so I do it the right way and miss the deadline. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> thankfully, I had really, really patient editors and uh, you know, ultimately to me just writing a book that was – of a similar quality to Kings of the Wild. If not, it's not exactly, it's not even quite the same kind of book, but of a similar quality to Kings of the Wild was really important to me and hopefully better. Bloody Rose follows a different set of characters, which is going to be both refreshing, but also a lot of this groundwork that you've laid in the first novel, as far as figuring out these, these five guys and, and this cast around them gets set aside pretty quickly. So, you know, for you, is that like, is that the breath of fresh air or is it now you've got a whole new dynamic to figure out and that's, you know, this significant challenge on its own? I think it's both good and bad. Um, that's another awesome question, by the way. I think it's both good and bad because if you're writing, say, a super serious fantasy series trilogy, then when you're in the second book, because you know you're writing for an audience that's read the first and because you know you're writing for a fantasy-loving audience, you don't need to explain anything, really. You can just plot, 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 plot. Whereas because I'm writing a book that can be read as a standalone from the first book, and if it's read as a standalone, I still want it to appeal to someone's aunt, someone's uncle, someone's friend that doesn't read fantasy. So not only do you have to introduce the whole character, all the characters in the world again, 
but you have to introduce every fantastical element in a way that doesn't bore the shit out of longtime fantasy readers and helps non-fantasy readers get into it. Uh, an example, like I've had some people say that Bloody Rose, you know, starts off kind of slow. There is a, like a segment where, you know, they're on the road as a band, but each of those chapters has something that it does. Like in one chapter, they'll talk about necromancy and the main character learns what necromancy is. To someone that's read all kinds of fantasy books, you say necromancer, boom, you're done, move on. But if you are assuming that someone who's read your book has never doesn't know what necromancy is, then you have to explain it. You just have to. And you have to explain it in a way that isn't doesn't seem preachy and kind of gets it across. So yeah, all those elements, you have to be careful because everything you introduce, uh, you need to make sure that it's palatable for everyone or as many people as possible, at least, I think. In Kings of the Wild, you definitely you see a lot of foreshadowing throughout the story. I mean, there's some things that you you introduce and it pays off very quickly, and other things yeah. that get, get introduced way earlier in the book that pay off further. And you said you were pantsing it through all of that, yeah. And it seems to work very seamlessly going into Bloody Rose. Then, do you have that extra pressure of being like, okay, like now I, I actually really need to pay attention to make sure that all of this is really tight. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, but because it's such a separate story, then there's a, it doesn't rely that much on the first one. It has a little bit, the things that happen in the first one affect uh, the second one, but it doesn't necessarily rely on it. So, But even today, I, I kind of, working on book three now, I did a little chart up with like the major events that's happened in book one and the major events that happened in book two, when they take place, where the story was at, at 100 pages, 200 pages, 300 pages, 400 pages, and then they both ended around 500 pages. And the first two have a remarkably similar pacing. Uh, I discovered today that both of them, the final battle, begins on page 451. Unbelievable. That's wild, yeah. <laughs> the exact same chapter starts on page 451. So obviously with chapter or book three, I have to do the exact same thing. <laughs> That's some like save the cat kind of stuff right there. If you're familiar, do you know, do you know what save the cat oh, is? No. It's a popular book in the screenwriting world. And it, it posits the idea that for a popular film to work, that there are specific beats that the story has to hit and it has to hit almost on certain pages in order to, because pages equal minutes in screenwriting. And so the save the cat posits that um, your inciting incident has to happen by page 20 by 20 minute where the audience will have lost interest. And this needs to happen here and there. So it's just funny that yeah. you, that you landed without trying so specifically on a, here's where things happen, you know, kind of moment. That's just, that's really funny. Oh, I know that's pretty crazy. And the, the battle in book two is a bit more, I would say more epic than the battle in book one. It actually, I got a city. There's a city map in book two Ooh. Um, because it's a place in a city. Oh man, all fantasy readers love a good map. So yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but the book is a little bit longer because the battle's a bit more epic. I don't even know how you make a more epic battle than the the one at the end of the, the first one. So that's uh, that's definitely very intriguing for me. Oh, I hope you I hope you like it. Yeah. So you've entered this this world as as you know as an author as a debut author with the last book. Um, it got a lot of buzz. Bloody Rose has came with a pretty fair amount of fanfare coming in. What's your entry into the world of published authorness been like? You know, what's your been experience as far as like meeting other writers, getting involved with the publishing world? Have you done like you know conventions and events and stuff like that? Yeah, I've done a couple a couple of conventions, not as much as I would like because I live in Canada, so it's a bit more remote. <laughs> I mean, I live near Toronto, but still, uh, you know, I think you, if you live in New York City or you live if you live in London, especially, you can attend so many things. Whereas to me, it's a it's an expense if if somebody wants to fly me anywhere, it's an expense if I want to. I sure as hell can't pay for it right now. So, but otherwise, the the world itself has been amazing. Like I've met so many incredible, like all my debut authors. I would never have guessed that you develop such a bond with the people that you debut alongside, regardless of whether or not your books are similar, regardless of whether or not you're with the same publisher, it doesn't matter. Like you're just all in this together. So if you're on Twitter together, or you're in a Facebook together group together, uh, you just kind of bond and you, you know what they're going through. And, and even when it comes to writing the second book, I, I, I like not like worry about them, but I'm like, I reach out to them from time to time and they reach out to me and they're like, how you doing? How's that deadline coming? Like, are you doing all right? Uh, Cause it can be really stressful. Uh, and they've all just been amazing people. And then the same goes for people in the industry, uh, the, the publicists I've met, the editors I've worked with. When you're outside, you may think that they're these kind of like, you know, corporate suits that are worried about the bottom line, but they're really, really not. Like, yes, they're all, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, they have to write, make books that sell, but they are readers and book lovers and really, really, really passionate people, every single one of them. And so, yeah, I've definitely been surprised at how 
just amazing and welcoming everyone is. And it's a pretty cool industry to be a part of. I'm always impressed when I meet uh, book publicists and, like you said, the people who work in, in the publishing because they are so invested in this world. They got into it because they love fiction, because they love the genres that they work in, and they are they are so wrapped up in it. And it's almost daunting sometimes because their depth of knowledge is is like so massive. And even as a fantasy reader of thirty some odd years, like I just I can't rack up with the stuff that they know because they just yeah. live in it all the time. Yeah, they're they're just they're they're fantastic people, and they have uh, they, they walk this fine line between you know they are able to be critical about the books they read and the authors that they're editing, but they also are huge fanboys and fangirls of not only the authors that they're working with, but authors all around them too. So it's, they live a pretty, they, live, they seem to have a pretty good time. Yeah. I mean, you speak of like fanboying and, and the stuff that, you know, that you're into what, uh, what other stories and media are you feeding your writer brain with now? What, what films and books and, and television shows and music, whatever, like, you know, what's moving you along? Uh, quite a few. I should, I should feed it with more. Sometimes I get sidetracked and I think that I need to just keep writing and I, probably shouldn't because I think eventually you kind of burn out and, and you've exhausted your quality words for the day. Um, so I'm trying to kind of strike a bit more of a balance where I do the things I love as well as write. Um, but yeah, I play a lot of video games as perhaps is evidenced in Kings of the Wild and Bloody Rose. There's a lot of Final Fantasy references in that second book. But yeah, these days, yeah, I play everything from, I play a lot of like Total War, like strategy games on the PC. I don't know if you're familiar with that game. Not really, no. Oh, normally it's like a historical kind of, like there's like Rome Total War and Shogun Total War and things like that. They're very like strategic and in-depth. But there's also a Warhammer Total War, which is fantasy. But on the battlefield, there's thousands of units. It's orcs and elves, and it's just amazing. And then, yeah, I play a lot of role-playing games and things like that. Uh, I watch a lot of like kind of fantasy TV shows. I love anime and watch a hell of a lot of that too, so... And then music-wise, because I'm on the third book and, the, and each book kind of goes through a different generation, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, so these days my playlists tend to be more like early hip-hop uh, and grunge and a lot of Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> it's, yeah, it'll be interesting to see as I get into to Bloody Rose. I mean, like you talked about like the 70s, 70s rock lends itself so well to fantasy and science fiction because of prog rock and just the nature of the storytelling they were doing. Whereas eighties gets more concise and a little bit more about ego. And I guess it depends if you're talking about pop or if you're talking about the hair metal of the time period, which is a, you know, a whole other mess of things. And, but yeah, like, I mean, as you go into like, do you find that like that's affecting your worldview as you, as you're listening to the nineties stuff and trying to reconcile what you're listening to with how it influences your story? Oh, it definitely influences the story, and especially with Kings of the Wild. Say you got the seventies, the seventies uh, music, which is a lot like the prog rock, and it's more rambling. And in a way, Kings of the Wild is like that. It's like a long, you know, it's like a journey. Um, whereas when you get to the eighties, it's like this, you know, like the the rock was, you know, giant spectacle, and then the pop was the hard on your sleeve, so emotional. Look at me, like listen to how much I'm in love with this person. And I think Bloody Rose has both of those things. Um, and then with in the nineties nineties music, it was a lot. A lot of it was like anti-establishment, and people were upset about things, and they didn't like the way the world was going or the government was working. Uh, and that will one hundred percent be a theme in in book three, and it will influence so much. I want to say more than the other two, but but looking back on them, probably not, just in a different way. Do you know where about like kind of like the timing when you expect that third band's novel to drop at this point? <laughs> no, no, it's definitely later than my editors would like, but uh, I like to think, I haven't said this to try this line on them yet, but I would say a book like a wizard, it arrives precisely when it means to. <laughs> um, I should try that one. I'm going to bet they've probably heard that one before somewhere. Yeah, in yeah. It. <laughs> um, I write really slow and I thought, you know, when I got into it that I'd be able to write, be able to write quicker. And I do plan on being able to write quicker. There's a couple of writers um, that I absolutely adore that I've come to be able to meet that have amazing, amazing uh, work processes and work ethics and just outlooks on it. And I'd, I'm going to try to be emulating them going forward. But these days, I mean, I just, I see writers post up, you know, writing a thousand words an hour or something like that. And even a day, I've written a thousand words a day, maybe 10 times. And I've pulled a lot of 18 hour days. Uh, I can write and write and write and write all afternoon for hours and hours and be like, oh, that felt great. What's your word count? 350. <laughs> I just don't write that, that quickly. Um, so yeah, we'll see. I mean, I'm in the, the process of many back and forth emails of negotiating a longer deadline. 
Uh, and the thing is, I don't want to keep people waiting a long time, but I, but to me, I think it's worth waiting a little bit longer. Uh, some authors I just don't think are book a year authors. We're so used to that and we like our, our books, you know, our entertainment to come to us as quickly as possible. But when I was a reader and I was a reader for, I still am, you know, for 20 plus years longer, I don't mind if a book comes out. Like I never expected back in the day, like when I was a teenager, every, every two years a book came out, I was happy with that. But nowadays people like a book a year and I, you know, I'm going to try to get to something like that, but yeah, I'm going to write it as fast as I possibly can, but as good as I possibly can and hopefully not sacrifice quality. I think it's it's definitely a challenging time because the you know like you said a book a year seems to be what the, the the expectation is for series authors in the publishing space. Independent authors are cranking things out at a rate that's just absolutely insane. I mean, there's this expectation yeah. that if you're going to make money as an indie author, you have to write a book a month or something. And yeah, yeah like you said, there's people that are they've got a thousand, two thousand words a day or something like that, where it's uh, I've, the pace oh, of that's yeah. insane. I've talked to someone that, that wrote wrote this the other day. I did a podcast with uh, Andy Pelican, and he writes fourteen thousand words sometimes in a day. Fourteen thousand? Yeah, I wrote fourteen thousand words this summer. <laughs> yeah, and that's granted, that's awful, but still. And some people though, like someone like Mark Lawrence, uh, writes so quickly. And apparently doesn't self-edit. He just writes it. And it comes out beautifully, really beautifully. I wish I could say, you know, look at this, you know, that it's always the longer the book, the better the quality. But that's not always the case. But I tend to, like, gravitate more towards authors that take longer on books. Bad example, perhaps, Patrick Rothfuss. Love him. His prose is great. I'll wait however long it takes for another book to come out. I don't care. Guy Gabriel K., my favorite author, book every two to three years he comes out with. The prose is great. I don't care. Um, and there's been a couple authors who um, who have start who sped up their processes, and they start coming out with a book a year. And then I read these paragraphs, and I think, oh, you don't you didn't care how this paragraph sound, so I don't care either, and close the book and never read them again. Well, I think you also see um, you know the, the difference between like the doorstopper style thing. You look, look at let's say, let's say like Abercrombie with with his uh, first law trilogy. Is that right? The first law? Is that the name of it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. With the first law trilogy, I mean, those are thicker books and, and, you know, heavier, heavier fantasy. And then, I mean, like, you know, the heroes and best served cold are these like massive hardcover volumes. But then he got into the half a King series and those feel like novellas by comparison, you know, like they're, yeah. they're slimmer, maybe 250 like pages, 300 pages, something like that. And I felt like I could fly through those. Um, yeah. And I like that too. I like mixing it up. I don't want everything I read to be, you know, a, a huge, you know, like volume every time. Uh, but uh, I really wonder sometimes if that's if that's just what the story dictated or if it was a response to those deadlines and needing to move faster through it. Uh, well, I think he purposely meant for those books, the Half a King ones, to be young adult. Really? Um, but I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, 100%. They are young adult books. I didn't know that when I read the first one. Uh, and I was like, oh, this seems like a light version of what I normally love. And yeah, they are 100% young adult books. Wow, I, those books are still pretty brutal, so I would have never thought of them yeah, in that yeah. way. Well, okay. Down that much, but uh, but yeah, I mean, to Abercrombie's credit, he wrote his, he did write those books. I mean, maybe there was a two-year maybe gap between one of them, but he wrote those books pretty quick, and I thought he got better every single book, uh, and has continued to get better every single book. Like with his mainline ones, I'm always blown away by his stuff. And then with he's working on that new series, you know, and it's. It's taking a while because he's writing them all at once. But what I think matters to people a lot is when you're open and honest about it. If you're online, if you're on your blog, or you're saying, hey, this is where I am with the book, then people will go, are okay to go on that journey. If you're saying, you know, a lot of people have come out and said they've got anxiety or they're depressed and that people will forgive that and they'll wait for that next book um, without chomping at the bit. It's when you say, oh, it's coming now. Just kidding. It's not. Oh, it's coming now. Just kidding. It's not. That's when they tend to get mad. Yeah. Yeah. You see that that problem in the video game world where, you know, shifting release dates make the audience furious. Uh, yeah. I, I think in, in the book world, you know, it's 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 easy to hear the vocal minority that are like absolutely like on your case, chomping at the bit for stuff all the time. But uh, books have such a long tail. You know, they're they're very different, I think, from the way like say you know tv shows where there's that spe expectation of schedule in the same way because so many people will discover a series well after it was published and but it, but more and more i think because it's such a you know it's a clogged market and there's more books being released than ever there is that need yeah. to stay in front of people's faces and and keep them totally. buying because it's so totally. easy to drift off otherwise 
Uh, Nick, th- this has been excellent. I uh, I really appreciate getting to dive into your brain uh, about all this process. Like I said, uh, Kings of the Wild, I just absolutely loved it. Um, I know it's a book I will reread because I enjoyed it so much, and, and I can't wait to Bloody, – Bloody Rose is sitting on the shelf and ready to go, so I'm, I'm ready to dive into it. Uh, where should people be following you and keeping up with you and you know just knowing what's happening with, with you and your writer's journey? Uh, I'm fairly active on Twitter. You can find me at Nicholas underscore Eames. And then I'm on Instagram and Facebook as well. If you like pictures of books, boy, Instagram. My Instagram is the place to go. <laughs> I take a lot of pictures of the books I'm reading and the comics I buy and uh, things like that. So, Well, awesome. All right. Well, I hope everybody who is listening to this will go out and, and uh, pick these books up because they're, they're absolutely awesome. And uh, look forward to seeing where that series and your career goes next. Thank you so much. Well, thanks. It's been a really, really pleasure. Thank you so much. Fictitious is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Buskey, and co-produced by Wendy Buskey. If you've got a few minutes to spare and you'd like to help out the show, here are a couple of ways to spread the word about Fictitious. One, you can leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And two, you can share a link to the show on Twitter, Facebook, or wherever you do the social networking thing. I can't stress enough how much these simple actions help to spread the word about the show, which helps us grow and bring you more awesome author guests, and it also helps those writers reach new audiences. You can follow Fictitious on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all under the handle FictitiousPod, and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. And you can find all our episodes, plus book reviews, at FictitiousPodcast.com. Thanks for listening. More author conversations coming your way next week. (laughs) 